friend, Morgan Curtis. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see this PowerPoint that I put together. I'm kind of a low information PowerPoint user, um, but it's always nice to have um, a little bit of something to refer to on the screen. Uh, as Michelle said, I am Morgan Curtis, and I'm here to talk to you about using data to inform your primary prevention work. Um, excited to be here. I've done some trainings for WICSAP in the past, both in person and online, and this is always one of my favorite groups to chat with. Um, we will be doing, as Michelle also said, quite a bit of interactive work today in breakout rooms. Uh, because of the limitations of Zoom's technology for breakout rooms, I recommend having um, either a document up on your computer that you can type some notes into or a piece of paper handy to just write um, down the prompts for the discussions that you'll be doing in pairs. Uh, I will also, as we go through, once you get into the breakout rooms, I can flash across the screen, um, like you can broadcast messages, but they don't stay in your chat uh, usually. So um, that's a, a little bit of a limitation. So if you can just, you know, have something handy to jot down what I have asked you to talk about, that would be handy as we move forward. Um, also, the way that my screen is set up, um, I have du dual monitors, but on neither of them can I see you when the PowerPoint is up um, because of the way the PowerPoint operates on my screen. So um, if you're like waving at me or looking bored or asleep, I'm not going to be able to see that, but feel free to use the chat because um, it will pop up for me. And I'll be able to see waving, so okay. you can, you can, at me. You can tell me that, that everybody's furiously <laughs> bored or you waving bet. or whatever. Absolutely. Um, so I uh, help run a consulting business called Collective Capacity Consulting. We do um, nonprofit work around primarily program evaluation and primarily for nonprofits working to end um, sexual and domestic violence. Uh, I've been doing this work for you know, 15 or so years, and I've done a lot of this work around particularly evaluation and data use for prevention, um, primary prevention specifically with sexual assault centers. I worked at the State Coalition in Texas for about 10 years, and I've been consulting since then. Um, my real passion is uh, trying to help organizations figure out what are ways um, to find data that help tell meaningful stories about uh, the work that you're doing that also feel really resonant with the communities that you're working with and that don't continue to perpetuate some of the unjust and inequitable data practices that um, scholars and evaluators um, have fallen into over the years. So um, this is, Zoom is not my favorite way to try to share this enthusiasm, but I'm going to try to do my best with some cartoons and again with letting you all have some time to talk with each other. Um, but if we could just uh, use the chat box for now to tell me a little bit about your role and your organization, that would be helpful. And then we're actually going to go into our first dyad right after that. You can also chime in if you want to unmute yourself and just speak if that's more comfortable for you than um, writing in the chat box. It would just be helpful if I had a sense of kind of who you are and what you do. Are we supposed to speak now? Yeah, you can speak or you can put in the chat oh, box. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sally Lynn. I don't know if you can see my face, maybe not. Um, but I'm with True Speaks and it's my own company where I do sexual assault prevention education webinars. Great. And I used to be with the uh, Sexual Assault Center for Pierce County. Okay. And I try to get uh, whatever groups want me. So I don't, I try not to be limited by what grants say what groups I should go to. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm not nonprofit. I am for profit. I don't ever make a profit, never have, probably never will. It's okay. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm real interested in this. I'm always coming across data that I want to understand more and my students ask me about it and I want to be an expert and I feel like I'm not. So I'm happy to be here. Great, glad to have you. Uh, I see in the chat we have several prevention people, uh, volunteer and intern supervisors, that's great. 
Um, they're my favorite people to work with, no offense to everybody else in the world. All right, lots of victim services folks. Great, anybody else wanna pop in and, and say something via audio before we move on to dyads? Great, and youth development specialists, excellent. Prevention advocates, excellent. So you're you're the folks I'm used to speaking with uh, about this, um, and and who I assumed would be here. But it's always good to do a check in just in case there are other folks, so I can uh, come up with new uh, examples as we go along. So, like I said, we're going to go immediately into um, breakout rooms just to give you a chance. Uh, first of all, to connect with each other. You'll probably be in the same breakout for the entire time. Um, that's kind of the plan. To just each each section, I'm going to do a little bit of talking at you, and then I'm going to let you do some talking with each other, and then I'll talk at you for a little bit, uh, and then you can talk with each other again. I think that's the best route for integration. But we're going to start with this prompt. Uh, when did you learn something that challenged the way your work is normally done? What did you learn and how did it change your practice? And I'm going to give you, um, you know, maybe 30 seconds to think about that prompt and write down any notes that you need to write down um, before, before we break you off into these breakout groups. Because um, as I said, uh, you won't be able to see the PowerPoint when we do that. So uh, when did you learn something that challenged the way your work is normally done? What did you learn and how did it change your practice? And Michelle, whenever you're ready, you can break them out into groups. You ended up in a room, but. I think you can move that, or I can also go. You, you can just, <laughs> well, you could just not go if you don't want yeah. to either. Okay. But you ended up in a group there. Yeah, I said, I said no. Just gonna, <laughs> no. <laughs> No. Let's see, let me make sure that nobody's alone. Because if anybody's alone, I will move them. Move to. Uh, oh, let's go to move five. There we go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Catalina, do you know when to go in a breakout or oh, there? Well. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I should be watching the time to set the little timer. There we go. Do you have a broadcast option, like a broadcast chat to yeah. rooms? Okay, I'm going to send you this and you can broadcast it. It's not Copy great. and paste I, it in the thing. Okay. Yeah, here. I wish they would create some way that you could like send people into rooms with a sticky note or <laughs> like I know some, right something that keeps because so many of us are doing things like this like sending you off to chat about something specific but the broadcast also it flashes up and then it goes away after like seven seconds or something. Yeah, this isn't a hard thing right now. COVID, I really like COVID. <laughs> yeah, I know, really. It's like, yeah, the reality is we're all trying to do this work in the middle of a pandemic, and it's both foremost on everyone's minds and last on everyone's minds. I'm surprised that it's not, I'm surprised how much we've adapted because, and I feel like just, you know, personally thinking about, oh, let me pause. Welcome back. People will slowly be coming back. They get about 60 seconds before they get totally kicked back here. So All right, welcome back, welcome back. So as you trickle back in, we're just gonna 
you know, take a few minutes uh, for folks to share out anything that they found particularly interesting, or if it was nothing, that's also fine. But if anybody's group had some particularly compelling story or interesting story that you wanted to share, um, I'm happy to take a few minutes for a few of you to share that either in the chat box or um, if you want to unmute yourself, you can and tell us what you talked about. What what were some points of learning that that were noticed for people? I mean, I guess I would say our main takeaway is that right now we're all in the middle of the point of learning with COVID and mm. that this has completely changed how we've structured any of the work we've been doing. So mm. um, that we're, we're changing it right now and, and learning as we go. <laughs> Yeah, that's the Michelle and I were talking about the same thing while you all were off. Um, did you have any specific examples of like a concrete, like one something that changed or were it, was it the, just a larger conversation of, yeah, we're all in the middle of scrambling all the time and learning as we go? Was that, I see some nods like, yep, that's what we did. <laughs> I mean, definitely the generic was a lot of it, but also in particular our youth groups, um, mm. how to functionally have a youth group especially when we are their safe space in most situations and really? they are now at home and so how are we able to have those same conversations and allow them to be who they need to be and say what they need to say while we're there and that's a piece we're definitely still trying to figure out so. absolutely did you talk at all about what that process of trying to figure that out right now has looked like uh we didn't get into that part yet okay no problem <laughs> One more, any other, I mean, it sounds like I saw a lot of nods, like maybe this was the general tenor of the conversations everywhere, but does anybody else have some sort of specific uh, example that you wanna share? We talked a little bit about like what engagement is gonna look like and how like to engage really anyone, yeah, yes, youth and just anyone in general, because we're all kind of Zoom fatigued and yes, how to absolutely. have people have these conversations that are difficult to have in general, but then added barriers with Zoom. Absolutely, that's that's real and um, and kind of trying to figure out. You know, Michelle and I were also talking about like the transparency of facilitation has had to change for people <laughs> recently, and there's there's all of this you know chaos often in our you know physical spaces you know pets wandering in, children wandering in, partners wandering in, dogs snoring and that kind of thing. Um, so we're, we're, we're in the middle of a lot and, and kids in cat butts, <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, so good, you got it actually, what I was kind of hoping would come out of, out of this conversation to get us started was, was, was two things. First of all, um, an acknowledgement that what we're in the middle of is this kind of external shock to our systems, right? This thing that's happening to us that is asking us to, forcing us to reassess everything that we're doing um, and to do so in a way that's really quickly moving from day to day, right? So we're going to be talking about um, data use today. And we're gonna talk about how data are all kinds of things. Um, but what I wanna do is really ground this conversation, at least in the intention of realism. So the kind of quick moving we're being asked to do doesn't always allow us to slow down and think as deliberately as we might want to otherwise. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that looks like to slow down and think deliberately, but I don't wanna do that outside of the context of us all acknowledging that we're not necessarily in that space right now. Um, so some of this is a little bit like, when things calm down again, if they ever do, we can think more deliberately, but also knowing that we're in the middle of, of kind of the place that we're in, how can we also think about data and data use and planning um, in a way that, that, is, that is, speaks to the reality that we're in? Um, because as all of you are going through and making these decisions, you're using some sort of data to make them, right? Like you're, you're um, thinking about what you know about these youth groups and the fact that you're their safe place and the fact that they don't have one now to inform how you're thinking about moving forward, right? And then so we wanna think about how do you then continue to strategically, even if quickly and a little bit messily collect information that will help you to continue to plan for how to be there for the people that you need to be there. Um, and so I want you to, I, you know, we're going to, we're going to keep that frame and I'm going to let that frame kind of guide some of, some of the examples and the questions 
um, that come up later. And we're going to talk about this in the kind of more generic way a little bit as well. So I'm going to share my screen again. We're going to go back to the PowerPoint. All right, so in line with that, I did not set learning objectives for today. I have two guiding questions, two questions that I'm going to work, work through um, in what I share with you and that I'm going to ask you all to work through together um, because I want to also set realistic expectations for us. We are, as you all said, a little bit Zoom fatigued. Um, you know, we're dealing with the pandemic and um, increasing uh you know visibility of the racist violence in this country and fires and all kinds of things so i'm i'm not actually even setting expectations for what you take away today i'm just setting expectations for what um, i'm going to offer you today um, and that's just reflections on these questions um, how can we think about data and what can we do with data and i'm really going to foreground um the the data piece of this, because I think this is the piece that people struggle with the most frequently in my experience. Um, that's a data-driven um, kind of piece of guidance. Um, how do we think about what data are? How do we think about what collecting them means? And how do we think about doing that in kind of just and equitable ways? So in line with all of that also, um, you know, do what you need to do to be attentive or not attentive. Um, throughout the next hour that we have together. Uh, if you need to get up and walk around, keep your cameras off, turn your cameras off and on, um, whatever that looks like, that's all fine. Uh, and, you know, participate to the level that works for you today. So that being said, um, and again, just in the sense of kind of getting, getting um, a feel for where you all are at, these are some sort of informal data collection uh, methods that I'm sharing with you. Uh, if you could type into the chat box, or again, if you don't, if you're not more comfortable unmuting yourself and saying something, that's also fine. Um, what's one word that comes to mind when you hear data? And that could be an example of data or just an emotion that you have in response to hearing the word data. If you could just type something in there or unmute yourself and say a word, that's fine. All right. Numbers and graphs, charts, intentional, information, qualitative, numbers, numbers, math, tool, education, itself. Uh oh, that's, that's the one I'm actually more used to receiving. Um, uh oh, surveys. Yes. Asking the community. Well done. More than one word, but um, a, a bit of a, a preview of where we're going. Uh, any other words that you want to share? All right, well, feel free to share more as they come. Um, but yeah, again, these are the answers that that I often get numbers, math, surveys, um, or numbers and graphs. These are all like the bane of my evaluation existence. Um, just to put out there again, for the sake of transparency, I am primarily a qualitative evaluator, which means I, I work primarily with data in the form of um, words and pictures, conversations, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm also not, I'm not really swayed by the number kinds of data or the graph kinds of data, although you can of course um, turn words and pictures into those kinds of data. But this is how a lot of us have been trained to think about what constitutes data or that's what we know scares us about data is is the numbers or the pictures or the numbers of the graphs and we're not all good at, at working with those it's an entire skill set to learn how to um, understand those kinds of data and make sense of them and we're going to talk a little bit about that today um, but not go not go kind of like deeply into that skill set so what are data um, if any um, but he's ever been to a training with me before or seen some of the ones I have online. You've probably seen um, this particular cartoon or other cartoons from Fresh Spectrum that I just really like a lot to help explain uh, evaluation concepts. Um, this one is like an evaluator in a data store. And um, 
I think it's useful to kind of take a step back from, you know, what we've been trained to think about data and to understand the multitude of things that either are already data or that can be data, that can be used as data. Um, in prevention planning or in you know the work that we do in sexual assault centers a lot of people think about data and the first thing that comes to mind are like you know prevalence and in incidence data or demographic data about perpetrators and victims in our communities and certainly those are important sources of data uh, but there are so many other types of of data and types of information that we can use to inform our work that maybe we don't know where to find it or um, we don't know how to use it if we do know where to find it. Um, so although this this particular image is focused on evaluators, specifically people like me, um, what I want you to take from it is that there are a variety of kinds and sources of data, um, data about the aspects and facets of our local communities uh, and about the people in those communities that can really um, help us to think about the kinds of work we need to be doing strategically and that there are ways to also um, create opportunities to collect those data if they don't already exist somewhere. So what what is what is even the kind of uh, purpose of data? I think one of one of the things that gets us caught up a lot is when we get these numbers and these graphs, and like I said, we don't we don't necessarily know what to do with it. We don't really know what it means. Um, but what what I want us to hold together today is the idea that the purpose of collecting data um, is to really, you know, kind of paint a comprehensive picture or tell a comprehensive story about our community, about a part of our community, about the work that we're doing. And in order to tell a really compelling and complete story, we often need multiple types of data, multiple forms of data that can talk to each other, that can paint this complete picture, that can make it the, you know, as robust and, and true about our communities um, as possible. Um, and this is one of the things that really gets lost when, for example, we often have to do data collection driven by, you know, funder mandates or funder requests. Um, for example, years ago, probably over a decade ago, um, the CDC mandated that everyone do a needs and resources assessment, which is basically a bunch of data collection around, you know, what are the gaps in our communities? What are the resources to meet those gaps? Um, the intention was to tell a story about the communities, but the CDC mandated the kinds of data that needed to be collected. Uh, and they weren't, most people that I worked with really didn't know what kind of story those data were telling when they put them all together. They couldn't leverage those data into any sort of realistic decision making about their programming. So it ended up just being a, a reporting exercise. So we want to think about how can we make the data the most useful. At, let data answer specific questions, but also let data um, speak to other data so that we get a fuller picture of what's happening. Uh, and relatedly, um, we want to think about using data to tell stories, but also the way that using data to tell stories um, has aspects of power built into it. So um, particularly we know that with marginalized and minoritized communities, data are often collected from them, decisions made for and about them, um, either about, about programming, about policy, um, and communities aren't always involved um, in helping to make sense of those data, helping to, to decide what the data actually mean or what's going to be done with them. So as we're thinking, even, even on the smallest level, you know, for example, of like youth, you know, you've got youth groups, um, you're working with, with young people who see you as their safe space. And what does it mean to kind of give them some, some power in how the story um, about their needs is being told, the story about their success is being told, um, what kinds of data are meaningful to them, um, that kind of thing. Um, and since prevention work is really about creating safer, more just and more equitable communities, we need to make sure that our um, data collection, our data use um, practices are also centered in uh, equity and power sharing and that people are having a, a voice in, in what we're doing with the data. Uh, and so related to that also, I want to just offer 
the importance of context. So I mentioned that, um, you know, we want to tell full and complete stories and that often, you know, you all gave examples of numbers, numbers, numbers. These, these pieces of data often come to us as, as, as incomplete pictures. Uh, I'd like to tell this story about, um, I went to a retirement party for a professor of mine when I was a social work student. And at the retirement party, um, somebody got up to give, to give a speech about the great accomplishments of this professor. And the speech included this really long list of all of the positions this professor had ever held, the director of various institutes, the head of various departments, the editor of all of these numerous journals. Um, and the list went on for a minute, a minute and a half. It was probably dozens of things. And I just kept thinking to myself, if somebody didn't understand how academic positions work, they would just have thought that this person didn't know how to hold down a job. Um, because in, in academic positions, they often last a year or two, and they're, they're meant to last a year or two, heads of departments or editors or journals. Uh, they aren't meant to be long-term things, and it's a real accolade to have held those kinds of positions. But in a lot of other industries, having held that many positions would be a, a bad sign. It would be a sign that either somebody's not good at their job, um, that they keep they keep getting fired or that they don't settle into a job, it would be a sign of real concern. Um, so that's just an example of, you know, if you can have data coming at you that you may think you know how to understand based on your own context, um, but the data may mean something very different. And so having avenues to check in about that, again, this can be really informal, it can be really formal, we'll talk a little bit about what that means, um, but that we want to consider what what it means to engage in sort of collective meaning making. How, how do we gather data and then sit with our communities or sit with our community partners, sit with our staff, sit with our youth groups and try to understand um, what they actually mean. And this also means giving people an opportunity to speak against the data, to speak against the common story that's being told about the data, um, you may, you may get the community together and they may look at these data that were collected in a kind of ostensibly objective manner and they may just tell you that they're wrong. And so we need to be open to kind of those, those processes, those feedback loops. Um, and then that, that may be as important to our planning is that the community doesn't think the data represent them at all. Um, and that the most supportive way we can plan with them then is to think about um, how to tell a different story. So that's kind of just like a philosophical um, uh, orientation that I want to offer for the rest of our conversation together. And before we move into then the kind of nitty gritty, more boring parts of where can you find existing data and how can you, you know, create data that don't already exist. Um, I want us to, or at least you all to think um, collectively about some of this. So again, maybe a good idea to write down a note or two about the questions on here, and then we'll send you back off into dyads. Um, who do you think needs to be involved in making decisions about data for prevention planning in your community? Who's usually left out of those processes? And then again, because of the context we're in, how does how does the context of being in the middle of this pandemic and the way that we're you know living our lives online increasingly um, shift how you need to think about this. In some ways it may make some of these processes easier and in some ways it's going to make them more challenging, but certainly we can't not think about that um, right now. So take a few seconds, jot that down, and again I'll have uh, Michelle broadcast the, the questions back out to you. And whenever we're ready, you can break them out. <clears throat> okay, what would you like me to? I'm going to paste it to you. I know that there is a way to set my computer up such that I can see both the PowerPoint and people, but I have not figured out what that is yet. <laughs> Alicia figured it out. I did not figure it out yet. It's really weird to just be talking to the computer and not see any of your faces.
There we go. Kaylee, Liz, and Gina, you guys are in a group together. And Catalina, you are in a group with someone. So let me move to group eight. Seven, seven, there you go. You're a wonderful MC. <clears throat> I got it. Okay, you've been assigned to group seven. Welcome back. We'll give folks a second as people trickle back into the main room. All right. So again, just like last time, if we want to take you know, maybe two or three minutes to share anything that felt especially, you know, interesting in your conversation, challenging, interesting. Um, it's not critical that I know everything you talked about. Um, those conversations are really just to keep, you know, your own ideas flowing. But if there's something that, you know, felt really like, oh, we should share this with the whole group, or I'm curious if other people are having this challenge or this excitement or um, struggling to think about these questions at all, um, I would love to hear from folks. Again, you can Write it in the chat if that's what you're comfortable with, or if you want to unmute yourself uh, and share out that way, that'd be great. We had a good conversation. Um, we were talking about subjectivity versus objectivity mm. and how people in like the social science want to study from the outside and then, but then if you're going to do community um, data collection, they, they'd want to give their own opinions about what's going on. And so you know, who would, who would you trust then? Would you trust the people who are looking at it from the outside or the people who are looking at it from the inside? Right, and this is exactly, you know, this is exactly one of the driving questions behind this, this sort of, you know, philosophical kind of foundation I wanted to set for us that, that is maybe more important than the more specific pieces of, of information I'm gonna give you next is, and to give away my own bias, I'm not one of those. I'm not one of those evaluators who believes that objectivity is a thing to strive for, much less something that exists. Um, and and we definitely have a particular kind of scientist mindset that um, you know people in the academy who are coming down and have all of these really fancy models and ways to reduce bias and their collection of information. Um, that like who who are they who are they doing it for and and why and and yes obviously we have communities that have we have problems in right i mean we know that like white supremacy is an issue does that mean all white people know that <laughs> right it doesn't and so there's this way in which yeah we we want to we want to think about the fact that all communities have things that are problems they can't see about themselves yet or they don't know about yet and and that that somebody from the outside can see differently and also um it's not going to get us anywhere at the end of the day to then just go in under the mindset that this is true about people um, and not care about where they are in their own thinking. Um, and this is something we were going to talk about later, but here it is. Um, so, um, and at the end of the day, if our, if our goals are equity and justice, then taking the leadership, especially of, again, um, 
minoritized communities is really critical. And if they say no, that this is not true about uh, not true about us, um, then then there's an importance to kind of listening to their experience and following their leadership for the kinds of you know issues that they they want to see addressed. Um, so there's there's a lot of angles to that issue um, of who do you listen to inside or outside, and what does it mean to be subjective versus objective. Um, but of course, we have to, we have to remember that a lot of the a lot of research that's done is also done as as if people live in a vacuum, right? Um, randomized control trials are done trying to control for all of the external context, or a lot of psychological studies are done with college students because that's who's around the people who do research all the time. So there are benefits and drawbacks to a variety of ways of collecting and thinking about data. Um, so if we want to put our strategic thinking hats on, there's that one piece of, okay, so, you know, there's a real drawback if we're doing most of our psychological research on college students. Um, but then when we want to also, you know, keep those, those lenses of equity and justice kind of first and foremost in how we're thinking about collecting and using data. Um, other people who had kind of wanted to share out what the group talked about, we take one more maybe. Something yeah, that I, oh sorry, um, something that I was thinking about um, was how to be intentional with the data that we put out, right? Because there's like data that the state gets, but there's also data that like organizations can release in their newsletters, and like what information are we choosing to put on that newsletter that we have access to um, mm -hmm. that is also allowed to be shared um, so that we can keep receiving funding from like specific grants and things like that. Um, and how if we were able to be more intentional with that, like how many, how many cases do we deal with with one certain type of victimization that actually are seen through, uh, through law enforcement or through um, like various different agencies. Um, and we can see, we can see progress with that. Um, Cause I feel like that's what's left out of the narrative to the public. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, this service exists, but like what happens after that? Like what happens after that contact with the victim? Um, and I think that if we talked more about that, that it would be really progressive for the movement too. Um, I don't know what that would look like, but I think that sharing that would be helpful. Yeah, I think I think you make a couple of good points in there, and, and one of them goes back to this larger point I've been trying to make about decontextualized data. Right, we are used to reporting numbers about our work. We know what that looks like. Um, we also know how meaningless it often is when we get numbers back at us that are supposed to inform our work that we we don't know what they mean. I mean, this is part of why I started doing evaluation work at all. People doing pre and post tests, and then they get the post tests, they run the numbers pre and post tests, and they realize. Okay, so at the like I do show an increase at the end of the day of five percent um, in the direction I hoped it would be, but what does that mean, right? Like, what does that mean? Um, and it's not that numbers are bad; it's just that if if we want the numbers to be useful, there has to be context around them. There has to be meaning made around them. If we ask other people to make meaning of them, they can be misused. They can be misunderstood, um, and then they can they can sometimes be harmful. Um, but so that means that in the way that we're presenting the data that we that we tell some sort of story about what they mean we and that's part of you know involving people and in helping to tell the story involving the community whether that's your staff members or the youth in your the youth group that you're working with or you know the zip code or the school that you're working in that people have an opportunity to see how those data are going to be reported and add some context add pictures you know don't just give the graphs give pictures that give some information if you're in a situation where you know your programming allows you to do that and it's it's you know safe to share pictures or um, always giving explanations with graphs um, so that it's clear what the what those you know what those data mean to you what those data mean to the people you know the data comes from um, well, this has been really rich um, and actually we're, we're covering some of the things we're about to get to. So this is a much better way to, to cover the things we're about to get to than for me to just speak at you. So, so in light of that, um, was there something else that people talked about in this conversation that you feel like needs to be brought out into the room right now? The virtual room, I should say. Um, well, in my dyad with Rebecca, we were talking about how there's a 
big disconnect between the funders and the communities. And like, it just seems like to be in between those two worlds, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's just a lot of nuance and accuracy that's lost. And also just like, Absolutely. you know, the funders don't really have an actual sense of what the work looks like or, you know, how the community even like feels with our mm -hmm. presence, like trying to support them. Um, yeah, and so like, ideally like both be at the table if like we're just like the medium that is like trying to give funds and resources to the communities so yeah no absolutely and this is um this is a real tricky point for a lot of people because of course there's a lot of power um in relationships with funders and um you know uh, funders vary in their understanding of evaluation and the understanding of how to think about data um, and and in their uh, willingness to be intervened upon <laughs> about some of these uh, issues. But I think that, you know, one of the things that I've seen be successful in these relationships with funders is to give them to give them what they're asking for plus. Right. Um, so when we think about this is just kind of a repeat of what I just said in a way, you know, they're often asking for these numbers and numbers that we know often end up being not useful to us, to our decision making, or that don't feel good to the communities that we're working with. Like funders are obsessed with asking for demographic data for no apparent reason often. You know, if, if we're not actually using the data that we're getting um, based on, on, on demographics, which they're often not using, then, then we don't need to collect it. But it's just we, everybody, including funders, get into these habits of asking for particular kinds of data, which of course is, is um, demographic data are not apolitical. They're very tricky. <laughs> and it's tricky to ask people. And if, you know, funders only ask, you know, if they want demographic data based on gender and they give you two options, what do you do, right? Um, so, to think about how to to give them as close to what you what they're asking for as possible, um, except for when there are opportunities to clearly intervene with them about if you think what they're asking for is harmful, but then to continue to give them these additional contextual data um, that show what you really needed in order to make good, equitable, and just decisions about the programming you're doing with their money. Um, so if your funders have you know, long narrative things that you can offer to them at the end of the day that you use that as an opportunity to tell a story and a story that is clearly um, data driven, but maybe not driven by all of the data they specifically asked for, but the other kinds of data that you're collecting. Um, for example, uh, if you're if you're using, you know, Zoom or these other kinds of platforms, you can, you can save ch the chat transcripts, right? And that could be a form of data if you have a sense of what you're gonna do with it. Or if you're recording, um, you know, conversations like the one that we're having, those can be turned into data. You can record the conversations to the extent people are comfortable with it. Of course, you wanna be uh, transparent about these things. The trend, you know, the conversations with young people about the kinds of sense they're making of these data or the kinds of needs that they have. Um, and then you have some sort of hard evidence to support the kinds of claims that you want to make. Not that you send, obviously, the conversations directly <laughs> to the funders, but that you then use that as support in crafting the kind of programming you, you want to do, the kinds of decisions you need to make either day to day, right? How am I going to do things differently tomorrow? But also, how am I going to do things differently next year? And that you have an opportunity to speak back to a funder about, you asked for these data, but in order for them to be useful, I needed all of the rest of these data, and this is how I'm making decisions. Um, it's not going to work for every kind of funder, but I have seen some funders really be moved by, um, by both the claims about the the inequity that's perpetuated by the kinds of data they want but also the fact that the data they're asking for aren't useful they don't want to waste their money or your time because your time is their money at the end of the day right and i hate to boil it down to that but with funders sometimes that's just the language that they understand um and if they're asking you to continue to spend time spinning your wheels doing things that aren't really useful at the end of the day and or are harmful some of them are moved by that now, of course, if we're talking about the world of RPE, it's a much larger kind of thing to tackle because it goes all the way up to the CDC and um, the CDC is notorious for, 
you know, changing its mind every five minutes, first of all, but also not being, it's not an easy ship to steer from below because there's just like too many layers of hierarchy between us and them usually. Um, but yeah, that's a very long winded response to you, but just to say, yeah, it's, it's a super tricky space to be. And I just, I, what I would hate to have happen is to walk away feeling like, well, I have to give them what they want. And then I don't know how to be the mediator between what they want and the community needs that there really is a way and, and to talk about the kinds of information you're collecting with your community partners um, and the way you're making meaning with them. If you can use some kind of like evaluative language around that or, you know, some of this more data sounding language around that to speak to speak to them, it, it can be effective. Anyone else? Because it's going to get really boring for a minute after this. So if you have like interesting things to say, this would be the time to jump in because again, these are far more fruitful. These are, you know, addressing the kinds of specific things you're thinking and saying so. Okay. Well, then we're going to dive into just some specific examples of where we find data. Again, we've, we've actually now covered um, several things. Um, so let me share this. So we've talked a little bit about um, just the kind of foundational philosophical pieces of how you want to think about um, the potential hazards of, of using data and the potential benefits of using data. So, um, and again, as I just said, we've kind of hit on some of these points already and I'll reiterate them a little bit as we go forward. Feel free, of course, if you have um, questions or need to go back to something to drop it in the chat or you know you can vocally interrupt as well um, or if you wave your hand Michelle can see you and let me know um, so where do we find data right and I'm gonna I'm gonna discuss some of these usual suspects just because it's at least useful to know about them um, even if it's just to know why they may not be useful for you. Because again, these are things that um, funders tend to ask for. The CDC tends to talk about a lot, for example, um, but other funders know about them. There are all sorts of sources of data that are already out there that you don't have to collect yourself, um, that you can find databases online, um, data that are already collected um, and crunched, analyzed for you, um, that many of these are federal level things that are happening that then can be broken down by state uh, or community. Um, of course, they don't always have the kind of sensitive information community by community that might ideally be useful for you, but they might be helpful in terms of just getting a general lay of the land. Um, so we have things like the youth risk behavior surveillance system and the behavior risk factor surveillance system, which um, are kind of what they sound like. The first one is, you know, particular kinds of risky behaviors that youth engage in. The second one is a little bit more geared toward adults. Uh, and there are some useful things in these lists that are kind of related to, say, risk and protective factors for sexual violence that might be good proxy indicators of kind of what's happening in your community. Um, but again, and I think you can't even get Washington specific data for the last year of YRBSS, if I remember correctly. So again, these are like not always the most useful, but but um, even to see kinds of the kinds of questions that they're asking can be useful or to see what's happening in other states or other communities can be a little bit um, useful. And of course, there's census data, which is useful for getting, you know, a, a particular kinds of demographic layouts of the communities that you're in or working with. Um, Some other examples that I think are potentially useful um, 
there's a database called the National Equity Atlas that looks at um, a variety of indicators of equity and can be broken down. Again, the problem with a lot of these, even though um, I know a lot of funders encourage people to use them, is you don't always get really good data for your own specific communities. Some of these are more helpful um, for larger communities. Like I think the National Equity Atlas, you can get Seattle and Spokane. So um, not the most useful for everybody, although again, kind of looking at what's happening in other parts of the state may be useful for thinking about kinds of data you may want to try to find or collect for your own communities. Um, but the National Equity Atlas, for example, has, I think they have one indicator that's about kind of like youth connectedness, how connected are youth in their community, and they, they tell you how they look at how they look at what that means so that you get a specific definition of what um, what that means to them, which gives you a little bit of a sense of how you might think about or use that particular um, set of data. Um, you have things like the Kids Count Data Center. Um, and then, you know, thinking a little bit out, outside of, of the box of the normal um, kinds of data to think about you know, especially for for day to day planning, um, social media statistics, where where are people hanging out online, especially now that we're all mostly hanging out online. Um, and what are, you know, what kinds of things are they doing? What do engagements look like online? I mean, especially we have, you know, lots of, of data out there on the kinds of um, problematic behaviors that occur online. But um, these kind of statistics are also just really useful for thinking about how you're going to frame conversations with community partners or how you're going to frame conversations with youth so that you're, you know, kind of up to date and savvy on what's happening um, and not, you know, continuing to um, not modify your materials such that they are relevant. Um, and then you know, we talk, these are the, those are the kinds of things I feel like most funders and most, most people talk about all the time, but I think it's also really important to remember that you're, you're working in communities, many, if not all of you probably have community partners, you're on committees, you're on task forces, probably too many of them. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, at least in my experience, the, those task forces and those committees don't always do well that they could be doing more well is to share the kinds of data that they're collecting. And again, you know, keeping in mind all of those, those caveats, caveats that I've offered about making sure those are shared with, you know, a robust kind of context to help people use, use them well. Um, but, you know, most nonprofits are doing some sort of evaluation, but not just nonprofits. Um, schools are, are doing evaluation. Community health centers, I mean, especially community um, health agencies are collecting tons of data right now, not all of which are going to be useful for you, but um, that you consider for these kind of partnerships, having data sharing agreements um, so that you're able to, you know, get a look at what kinds of questions are they asking in their evaluations and what kinds of things are they finding that you may find things that are really useful to your own understanding of what's happening in a given community. Um, and then, you know, a lot of, a lot of communities, a lot of school communities, but a lot of also, um, you know, smaller you know, municipalities or entire cities are doing climate surveys um, to get a sense for community norms and community behaviors and those can be really useful sources of data. Again, often these are just springboards to kind of begin to ask deeper questions about the kind of work that you're doing and not necessarily um, data sources that are gonna give you answers about the kind of work that you should be doing, but I think they are still um, fairly useful on occasion with, with a lot of caveats. Um, so with those examples just kind of being out there, does anybody, have and again you can put this in the chat or if you want to you know chime in vocally that's also always fine about any sources of existing data that you have already used in your work and then again these are things that you're not collecting yourself somebody else has done the work of you know designing the survey or going out and talking to people or observing things and they're either made available to you specifically um, or they're available you know on the internet or at large anybody have an example you want to share of something that you've actually used Crickets. <laughs> All right, that's fine. A lot of people. Oh, sorry. Again. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I just feel like I'm always talking, so I that's okay. Get well, I that's I'm good. I'm always using data from Wixap from the publications. I'm using 
um, National Sexual Violence Resource Center. I'm using Department of Justice. I'm using PCAR. Um, pretty much whoever I've trusted in the past that have said things that are very near to other people who have trusted who have said the same things. You know, okay. I'll go with them. Like uh, some uh, articles you'll see on social media. I mean, I won't recognize the name, so I won't go to them. Or I'll, I'll think, oh, New York Times, because of the great work they did on sexual harassment and the Harvey Weinstein case, I'm going to trust them on what they say about sexual assault in this case. Or BuzzFeed, I've seen mm -hmm. their numbers be very similar to the numbers I've seen from Wixap and Rain and NSVRC, so I'll use them. But uh, yeah, it, it's hard to know sometimes who you're going to trust. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, I, I try to stick with the nonprofit organizations and then whoever is close to them as far okay. as what they're still saying. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because it is, um, it's difficult to know who to trust is a really good way to put it because uh, because of all of the issues that we've talked about, right? A, a, a data, if you have just numbers, you can spin a story in a lot of ways, but also how are those data collected? You don't necessarily know. And the good thing about the databases that I have you know, offered is that you can see, you know, how those data were collected, that they're transparent about um, how, how they came to those, um, you know, how they came to those numbers, you can kind of dig in and see what their methodology was. And, and you need to have a little bit of, you know, you need to be a little bit literate in, in kind of data collection to, to know when they're good and when they're bad. So it's good to either, you know, get those skills, which takes a lot of time, or to at least have somebody around that you can run them through um, you know professors in your community who are willing to partner with you and say okay those these are concerning and this is why um, okay Vanessa said in the chat related to community partner data but I've looked at community needs assessments too um, yeah that's really useful so community needs assessments you know you can do them yourselves they're really time consuming and often not the most useful but if somebody else has done them you can you can get a really good sense of um, Kind of where the gaps in their community another really that's another really good thing though to kind of want to con consider how those data were collected and from whom who was involved in that process these are you know the, the questions you kind of always want um to be thinking about um so just really quickly um challenges related to these i think i've just i've just basically covered is you don't always know how um how the data were collected they don't often always you know, kind of speak specifically to your community. Again, they can kind of maybe springboard your thinking, um, but sometimes they can speak kind of close to the issues that you're that you're concerned about. Um, and again, kind of thinking beyond just sexual assault prevalence um, and incidents, but thinking about other kinds of community dynamics related to, to risk and protective factors for sexual violence. There are a lot of data sources that get really close to that. Um, so in the chat, successes in using the community data is that they include gr grassroots details. That's right, community specific data um, are gonna be obviously m more applicable. Um, and certainly if they're, if they're really being collected um, with the community as opposed to just from the community, um, you're going to have, you, you know, um, they're gonna be more, more valid and reliable for the kinds of things you want to do to make sure that you're really speaking specifically to your community and addressing um, issues that are, that are pertinent to them. Um, so again, I've already talked about a little bit about this, but to think about the kinds of collectible data that are already always around you. Um, and again, thinking you know, realistically about this, it's not necessarily about you need to Im implement you know, new surveys <laughs> or um, really, really formalized data collection. The, the, how formal your data collection um, will be depends on how, you know, how formal the use is going to be, which is to say that, um, back to this issue also of objectivity and subjectivity, um, you're not trying to make generalizable claims about the world through the data that you're collecting. You're trying to make decisions about the kinds of, um, prevention work you want to do in your community and what that needs to look like and why. So that means that the, the data need to be relevant to your community. Your community needs to have buy-in to those data and that's more important than the kind of um, 
scholastic rigor of your collection methods. So um, that can be as simple as, like I said, you've got ch you know chat boxes here. If if this was a community meeting as opposed to a training, and I asked questions and I asked for your input, I asked people to write into that chat box. You know, I gave you a statistic and I said, what does this mean? Does this feel real to you? What does this mean about our community? And people could type that in or say it, and I could take that and I could use that to inform my decision making. And those are still those are still data. Um, it can be, you know, conversations that you have with people, as long as you have some sense in advance of what you're going to do <laughs> with the information. Um, and you've been transparent about your collection of it. There are, there are a lot of um, ways in our daily lives that that we can do this um, and help to give context to some of those um, larger pieces of data. And this is a little cartoon that kind of gets at the heart of this that's related to the, you know, the conversation we've been having this entire time. Um, and so the person, this one person says, sure, our relationship is statistically, statistically significant. And then the other one says, but after interviewing some close friends and family, I had to conclude that it's also meaningless. Um, so, you know, scholarly articles tend to take numbers and they compare them to other numbers and then they say, okay, it's statistically significant. It's likely not chance. Um, so therefore it matters. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily, and actually even statisticians are starting to move out of this idea of statistical significance being the kind of gold standard because it doesn't really tell you anything about how things operate in the real world. So when you're thinking about what kinds of information are around you that are collectible all the time to help you um, make decisions about what kind of prevention work you're going to do or how you're going to alter your prevention work on a daily basis, um, to just think about ways that you can kind of seamlessly um, build in new data collection methods so that you can fill out the story that you're trying to tell um, and the planning that you're trying to do. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm gonna, um, I think I'm going to kind of move us into the final conversation, actually. Um, so often, and we've talked about this a little bit, because um, you all did a really good job of bringing up all of the kind of critical points in the conversations you've already had, but often we get into these cycles, even when we're not, you know, right now in this particular um, pandemic fueled kind of um, mode of crisis, uh, of just kind of making quick decisions that are not data driven in our work or that that are driven by our instincts but that we haven't double checked those instincts <laughs> um, with other forms of data which doesn't mean with statistics but it might mean with you know other community partners um, uh, or the community itself um, and we forget to uh, we forget to slow down enough to kind of check those check those instincts um which are often right but not always right because we have our you know we have our own kind of um likes and dislikes and our own kind of pet projects but as we're thinking about um prevention planning let's just do this last activity and then we'll come back for question and answers um as you think about um you know the key questions related to prevention planning like what are you, which are basically just what are you going to do with whom are you going to do it and 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 to what end um which is a side we're not going to get to but um as you think about that um let's just take the last kind of you know five or six minutes before the q a to think about what kinds of data could you realistically right now be collecting that could help inform your prevention planning to make it a little bit more systematically data informed and a little bit more um, community data informed. So take, you know, the next again, like a few seconds to write down any notes or, to, you know, to think about this and then Michelle can break you out into groups.
It's real hot in my room right now. <laughs> There's a lot of cops going by, huh? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I never know how to time these things online. There right. you go. All right, welcome back. We have just five minutes left. Um, so I'm going to open the floor up for the last five minutes to either additional pressing questions or issues that we didn't get to. Um, I'll drop my email in the, the chat as well, and you can email me if we don't get to something that you were really hoping we would talk about today. Um, but short of that, um, let's share out anything that, you know, you were inspired by in the what can we realistically be thinking about collecting to help our planning efforts or just other questions that you have. Yes, I will be also doing the community, community level, community something, evaluating community level prevention work training next week, which will build on this nicely, because um, you will all be fully indoctrinated to how I want you to be thinking about data. Um, so this will not also be your last chance, but I would love if you have some, you know, fun ideas that you had about what you're going to be realistically collecting or something else you want to share out or ask in front of the group. We've got a few minutes left. I have something, I have a specific question for you for um, a data set I came across, but I want to make sure everyone can share their group, their group work. You can first. also email me about that if you want. I put my email in the chat. I'd be happy to. I, I think the other people might find it helpful as well, actually. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll just tell you until someone says they have something more pressing. Um, Go ahead. So I was taking the safe sport um, training and where they're trying to do sexual assault awareness in uh, sports for coaches and volunteers and everything. And okay. it was great. And it was really good training. And it's only 20 bucks. So if you want to go take it. Uh, but one of their things was uh, one out of 10 kids will experience sexual assault before the age of 18. And I was okay. like, what? You know, I always heard one in four girls, one in six boys. Um, so I emailed them and asked them where they got it. And they got it from uh, a study um, that Darkness to Light actually has as well. So I was reading okay. on the darkness to light.org thing. And it, they were saying that um, the study before it said one in four women and one in six men report they were sexually abused as children. Unfortunately, this has been translated into one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused before they turn 18. And I thought, okay, well, that's understandable that it's not the same thing as they have experienced and they will experience it. Mm -hmm. um, and then they go on to talk about where they get their one in 10 statistics from. But then they talk about how you can, how you can say those one in 10 statistics and, um, they were saying one in 10 children will be sexually abused before age of 18. And I was like, Hey, you just said you can't say it like that. So I want to know if you've heard anything about the one in 10 versus the one in four, one in six. I have not specifically. And I see Michelle giving a big old head shake over there as well. Um, but it does point to a bunch of really, you know, tricky issues about, data use and about throwing numbers around, right? Um, because the, the one in 10 will, or the one in four or one in six will, is, is meant to rile people up, right? It's a particular kind of, uh, frankly, a scare tactic, but it's, it's at least trying to be a scare tactic for good reason. <laughs> um, like right. we want yeah. people to do something about this. Um, but of course we can't, our, our statistics are not predictive in that way. Um, it's just saying based on what, based on what we know has been true for people, it's likely to continue to be true for people, therefore we're gonna say will. Um, but you can't design a good, a good study to actually predict the future, right? We don't have that, we don't have that ability. And so they're, they're taking a leap based on the data that they have to say the future will be like the past. Um, but, but their ability to even say one in any number of people has been, um, Again, you always want to think about what what were the questions they were asking of whom, um, how did you know, and of whom from where, um, because these data sets are all also collected from particular groups of people. They 
usually randomly selected, but randomly selected from you know, what subset of people, what questions did they ask to come to those conclusions? Because, um, you know, we, we, we get vastly different statistics, right? And then we start to have fights just about the statistics as opposed to like, how, how did they come to those statistics? What were, what, what specifically were they asking? Um, and especially with, you know, incidents and prevalence, the questions that they're asking to find out who, um, who has been victimized and, and in what ways, they vary drastically among studies. Um, and, you know, some, some studies will ask, you know, um, a battery of questions, 10, 15 questions about very specific incidents that ask, have you experienced this? Okay, you haven't experienced that. Have you experienced this? Um, and some will just straight out just say, have you ever been a, you know, a victim of sexual violence? And they're going to come out with vastly different numbers based on who self-identifies, um, versus who says, yes, I've experienced this particular act. And those people may not self-identify as victims, right? Um, but we would label them as, based on our definitions of sexual violence, victims. But these groups might both report, you know, one in however many people is a victim. They're going to they're gonna come out of the other side of collecting those data with the same story. But you, you have to go back and find out what are the ingredients that came made them come to that conclusion, right? Um, so it's not necessarily that you look at those statistics together and you're like, one is right and the other one's wrong. Um, but, but what are they ultimately really talking about? Because they're communicating just one kind of, um, one catchy phrase. Yeah, Morgan, I like how you talk about ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are, what, yeah, you're seeing the cake, but like, right. is this a cake made with applesauce instead of eggs? Um, <laughs> you don't know necessarily until you've tasted it or until you've looked at the recipe. Um, right. And I think this is, this is the thing that when the NISFIS came out, which I can never remember what that yeah. stands for, but the, when the NISFIS came out, it was like the questions were already building in a definition around sexual violence and that was being interpreted. The, this many people haven't you know, experience sexual violence based on, you know, how we're defining it and we're using lots of different scenarios to get them at that question. Whereas mm -hmm. if you ask somebody, have you been sexually assaulted? Have you, been, you know, experienced domestic violence? People don't respond to those particular definitions or know what those definitions are. So using those kind of things is how we, we get that. But yeah, I agree about the future thing. The, this will happen. It's, yeah, weird. You don't know that. You don't know that. <laughs> All right, we're like three minutes over time. I can stick around for another few minutes if people have pressing questions or things they wanna share. Um, I understand that though we are over time, so if anybody needs to trickle off, there will be no hard feelings or anything like that. And also you can uh, catch Morgan again right here uh, next week at the same time. Um, yep. So we're gonna to continue to build on this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I put my email in the chat, so feel free to be in touch if something comes up for you that, you know, you'd like to chat about. 